I'm Tom Barrett, and I'm talking with Mark Matsumoto, who is the creator of the blog No Recipes. Mark is a member of Ketchum's Food and Social Media Advisory Group, and we're going to chat today about social media and what's happening in the area of food. So, Mark, why did you get started blogging in the first place? Well, Tom, um, I come from a background in technology marketing, so I've worked at companies like Netflix and Thumbplay, and so I've been blogging professionally for um, probably 10 years now. And through that, I'd, I had a lot of personal blogs, but uh, none of them really stuck. You know, I'd update them for about six months, and then uh, they stopped getting updated into the blog graveyard. Um, but with no recipes, it was a little bit different because I actually had started having people that showed up to the blog and left comments that weren't people I knew. They weren't my friends, and so that really kind of got my interest. And you know, from there, it just started growing. And what do you think <laughs> you were doing there that got people's attention? Um, you know, honestly, like I think there's sort of three, especially with food blogs, there's sort of three key things. Um, the first thing is photography. You can have the most eloquent prose on a blog, but if you're taking pictures with a phone camera, um, you lose people in the first few seconds and they're not going to come back and read your great writing. So I think the photography is very important. Uh, the second thing is to offer something original. So there are estimated 20,000 food blogs out there, and a lot of them are just rehashing each, each other's ideas. They're taking things out of cookbooks, and you know it's just another lasagna recipe. Doesn't necessarily offer anything special. So you know some people, their tact is to inject their own life into it. You know if they're like a single mom at home cooking for their kids, they might be writing about lasagna, but people are really going to read about this lady's life. Um, and so you know for me, I like to really try to infuse a lot of creativity into my cooking and come up with something original. And you, then you got something right now on green gumbo. Yes. So clearly, that's not your average gumbo. <laughs> not the average gumbo. In fact, green gumbo is traditionally vegetarian and made for Lent. But uh, you know, I went in and put some bacon and andouille sausage in it, um, which gives it a nice meaty flavor. And it's something—it's a different take on something that's pretty common. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I think the sort of key to success in blogging is honesty. I like—I basically put forward my idea, whether I like something, I hate something, and it's um, and and. It, it, I apply that same philosophy to myself, my own cooking. So I put my failures on the blog as much as I put my successes. And the, my thought behind it is that no one's perfect. No one's expecting like a blog where everything is perfect. So you know, if I, something that I make doesn't quite work out right, I'll put it up and say why it didn't work right. And hopefully people can learn from my mistakes. When you look at the overall content that's out there, talk to me a little bit more about what kinds of food content specifically really seems to be appealing to uh, both audience members and food bloggers right now. Yep. I think, again, I go back to the, the whole thing about having some kind of original content. But the trick there is there's a really fine line between having something original and something creative, but having something accessible. And so as a blogger that doesn't cook with recipes, I just go out there and make something interesting to me. And what's interesting to me isn't necessarily interesting to a lot of people. And so I've had to kind of figure out that fine line, that fine balance between making something that's unique, creative, unusual, um, but then also appeals to that mass market. So that, that gumbo is a great example. You know, it's sort of a new take on a classic. Yeah. What, uh, what are some of the creative things that you've seen that companies are doing to engage bloggers across the board, whether it's a food company or another kind of company? Sure. I, I mean, I've seen companies go to extremes by flying bloggers out to different locations around the country for events. But um, I think right now it, we're sort of in the infancy of this. And the two biggest failings I see is that the first thing, they're not targeting the right bloggers. So, you know, uh, a professional chef isn't going to be writing about um, a packaged pizza dough. Um, but at the same time, you know, they may have a lot of traffic. And then this mom that's got 10,000 visitors a month, not a huge blog, but they're very passionate about you know, her writing. Um, they may pass up, but she's targeting you know, mother working mothers that don't have a lot of time to make their own pizza dough. So that really is the user that you should go after, even if it isn't the biggest blogger, because they're going to have the most impact. Um, and then the other thing is a lot of the events that I've seen don't really engage bloggers. They'll bring in a celebrity chef and show a demo. Or they'll, uh, you know, they'll woo you with a nice gift basket, but um, there isn't a lot of engagement with the product. Uh, and I think some of the best events I've been to were events where it's held in a, a like a teaching kitchen at uh, like the ICE, where you know a chef comes in and they actually demo the product for you, and you get to tr to make your own pizza with the pizza dough, or you get to work with the chocolate. 
Um, and I think that gives the blogger an opportunity to actually try it in a setting where you know the, the messaging can be controlled and if they have problems with it, it can be fixed. And then I think they're a lot more likely to go home and write about that um, because it's, it's really an experience, not just a show that you're going to watch. You do a lot with video outside of blogging and have started to get involved with video online as well. Why do you think video is such a compelling element of food blogging now and becoming so po such a popular part of storytelling and food blogging? Sure. You know, I think video is very popular because it's um, food is a very visual thing. Um, people love to look at food, love to look at delicious food. And at the same time, it can be very complicated. There can be certain steps that when you're writing it in words, it could take two paragraphs to explain. Um, but it's a technique that can be shown through a video. Like if I'm just in the kitchen showing you how to do this thing, you know, I can just set the mixer up, put it in, I can show you the consistency that the egg whites need to be. And it makes it very simple to explain something that could be complex to explain through words. And so I think the video is a great balance between the really appetite wedding visuals that get you excited and enticed, while at the same time really showing you the intricacies behind the technique that makes food really good. If a company would like to develop a relationship with a food blogger, what kinds of things should they be thinking about? Um, you know, I, I think if the company is trying to build a relationship with the blogger, the key is really to, to target it well. You know, do the research behind the blogger. What kind of things do they blog about? What kind of things do they write about? Um, because I think when you find a really good fit with a blogger and a company, the blogger is going to be excited about working with this company because it's a product that they use or that they love and, you know, really kind of fits in with their style of cooking. Um, and that's just going to, you know, create a lot more, um, going to create a lot more value for the, for the company. If you were to look ahead, um, what do you think, how do you think blogging will evolve as new tools and techniques come into play as people start to use more video? Do you think we're now looking at maybe new kinds of channels in the future as well? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's definitely a shift, um, you know, from traditional media, whether it's newspapers, magazines, or, or television even, to on online sort of shorter form content because people just have less time. So, you know, people are going on in, in short bits and they're reading their RSS reader, they're going to taste spotting and looking at a grid of photos and, you know, picking which one looks best rather than sitting and flipping through a whole 100 page magazine. Um, and same with TV, you know, I mean, a TV episode is 30 minutes to 60 minutes, and that's, that's a real time commitment, whereas if you go on YouTube and, you know, you're searching for a recipe for pasta carbonara, you know, you can find, uh, actually YouTube limits it at 10 minutes, so, you know, most of your videos are going to be nice and short, and there's a lot of interesting content out there, so um, I, I definitely think there's a shift to that, and, you know, for me, I see sort of the more traditional media, their expertise in, is in being able to spot great content. Um, that's what editors do. And so I think on the flip side, with all the content being generated now, there's just a glut of stuff and sorting through that is difficult. So I, I really see in the future, the traditional media is going to be like a gatekeeper. They'll be like a curator finding all the best content for their, their demo, putting it together and aggregating it onto a site. So the content creator gets exposure and then you know the the um, the magazine or the publication is able to cater to their specific niche, um, all the the great content that's out in the internet. Okay. Thanks very much, Mark. Sure. That was so great.